Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the concept of the is that the theory of the So my name is Craig Ferguson. I'm a research professor at University of Albany uh, Research Sciences Center. And uh, quickly in this talk, I'm going to uh, give a context for my work, I'll explain the impetus for why I will be using OpenIFS, the workflow that I've planned, and future plans. Uh, I guess the advance is not working. OK, um, my research foci cover about three, there are three foci. The first is assessing variability, long-term trends and change in the Earth's coupled water, energy, and carbon cycles. The second is understanding the role of land atmospheric coupling and climate variability, climate extremes, and the predictability of regional climate. And the third is de developing and applying process-oriented diagnostics that help identify and attribute model errors. So the underlying theme here is, is coupled and process-oriented diagnostics. Um, and most of that work is, is framed through uh, GWEX panels that I serve on, so GLASS, the Global Land Atmosphere System Study, and GHP, which is the global, uh, the GWEX hydroclimatology panel. Um, for my work, I rely on a number of observational data sources, satellites, uh, sensors including MORTIS airs, AMSER SMAP, routine in situ measurements um, from the land, spanning the land atmospheric continuum, models. We run, I run some models in-house, so offline land models, coupled wharf model, coupled wharf with land data assimilation. Um, other models, I just analyze the outputs directly from the U.S. North American Land Data Assimilation System, the CMIP 5-6 climate models, and other global atmospheric reanalyses. Um, introducing land atmospheric coupling, I'd like to present first this Mike Eck diagram. We call this the Eck complexity of coupling. And you can see a number of um, positive and negative feedbacks. Um, so we can start at sensible heating. So if we have a positive anomaly in sensible heating, then we're going to, temperature will increase. We'll have a growth of the boundary layer. Dry air entrainment will increase. We may have a reduction in cloud cover. And that will have a negative feedback on uh, surface humidity and latent heat fluxes, which will drive further increase in surface temperature. So we have a positive feedback mechanism there. Alternatively, you could imagine if you have a low-level jet of moisture, you may be triggering up, like the easterly uh, African low-level jet. You may have increased sensible heating here, and you're triggering up that moisture, and you may trigger convection. And then you rain, and you have a negative feedback pathway. Um, so this is the complex version of coupling. Uh, for the GWEX, glass panel, we have a, what we call a local coupling working group. And we've boiled that down to a simplified form. And we call it uh, local process chains. This is the GWEX local process chain. We're talking about anomalies in the surface soil moisture. Uh, we get anomalies in evaporative fraction at the surface, may trigger um, subsequent changes in the lifting condensation level, which may trigger, trigger changes in the um, trigger, uh, development of clouds and perhaps precipitation which may ultimately feed back full circle to changes in soil moisture. So um, we say local because all coupling starts locally. The land signal, that's the sensitivity of the vegetation to soil moisture, is necessary, but it's not sufficient because you also need that atmospheric state to be responsive to that uh, variability in surface fluxes. Um, just a quick recap of how I define land atmospheric coupling. So coupling is the, the degree to which anomalies in the land surface, we're talking about soil wetness, soil texture, surface roughness, temperature, and overlying vegetation composition and structure can affect through complex controls on the partitioning of that surface flux, um, the planetary boundary layer, mesoscale circulations, and in extreme cases, rainfall generation. So um, this is what people tend to focus on is the soil moisture precipitation feedback pathway. Um, but I would agree with Alan Betts in the statement that uh, this coupling strength is the single most fundamental criterion for evaluating, um, especially um, 
um, deterministic hydrologic and atmospheric model runs. Um, so quickly, when I think of coupling, when do I think it matters most? Well, in some cases, um, at long time scales, coupling may not matter, but on the time scales that I'm certainly interested in, um, diurnal time scales, uh, temperature and humidity, clouds and rainfall, the evolution of drought and the recovery of drought, heat wave severity, um, these are the cases when I believe that having realistic coupling in your model are paramount to uh, uh, prediction. Um, it's also generally in terms of um, the condition you're, you're talking about states when you have large scale synoptic forcing is weak and the spatial gradients in the surface fluxes are sufficient enough to drive mesoscale circulation. So in summary, uh, Paul Dermeyer puts it nicely in terms of this is the intersection of sensitivity of the land surface, variability of that system, uh, and memory. So when you have all three, this is when you can have a strong impact of coupling. So the one aspect of the land has to be uh, strongly covariating with one aspect of the atmosphere. It could be atmospheric water demand. It could be just simply precipitation. And there's large anomalies. So we're talking about semi-arid regions where they have a large potential um, range of surface flux partitioning. And then it also has to persist. So it has to be in a region where um, the frequency of rainfall is such that you don't have um, many, um, many small rain events which would eliminate the uh, persisted memory of a long drought period. Um, so you have to have the intersection of these three characteristics for a coupling to um, play a large role in your predictability. Uh, so I mentioned the models. I want to talk about model coupling. So this is a probably well-known result from the Global Land Atmospheric Coupling Experiment 1 results. And they're spanning a number of models here and looking at the spread and the co-variability between the soil moisture and lifting condensation level. You can see nine models here. And I'd like to point out the GFDL model is the most tightly coupled. So it's very strongly coupled. And CCMA, what I would say, is probably the most weakly coupled. Uh, there's very few cases where we have observational verification constraints on these models, so it's unclear which is more accurate other than places like the ARM SGP site and Cabal, where we have land atmosphere um, continuum observations. But this is the state of models, lots of uncertainty and little verification data to determine uh, who, is the, um, who is the winner of the beauty contest, per se. Um, I personally looked at intercomparing models to Ameriflux FlexNet stations. You can see these bars are the uh, estimates from the local FlexNet site for coupling the soil moisture evaporative fraction, so that land leg of atmospheric coupling. You can see by and large the models, uh, off, both offline and reanalysis models, are always more strongly coupled um, than the local estimate from observations. So my sense is that the models are, are generally too strongly coupled. Um, an operational example of wind coupling matter, matters um, in the U.S. Uh, we're giving the NOAA CFS team a lot of um, slack because what happened is that in the CFSR, they noticed their two meter temperature skill was very poor. And so they decided, let's make a quick fix and we'll lower all the rooting depths for just this crop vegetation type highlighted in green. We're going to allow these crops to see the deepest layer in the soil moisture column. So real, re, what really happens is that these crop types always have water. So they can always evaporate. And that will cool by evaporative cooling the lower screen level temperature 2 meter. Um, so this is the GLDAS model. So this is a land model forced with observed uh, base precipitation. They had a bias of about 4 watts per meter squared in latent heat fluxes. And their forecast was 27 watts per meter squared. So they wanted to reduce this bias and that two meter temperature. They decided to extend this rooting zone depth. Um, when they did that, they uh, certainly reduced this sensible heating bias, um, reversed it from 18 watts per meter squared to uh, negative 10 watts per meter squared. And you can see this clear delineation of that crop land mass, crop vegetation land mass, where they made that uh, modification. Um, but in doing so, um, yes, they solved their two meter temperature warm bias, but they also uh, 
created, in the meantime, they created the problems with the boundary layer simulation because there's a perpetual fog over this region. So we say here, uh, you know, the temperature air was reduced, but we get the right result from the wrong region. So this is uh, the implications for this for Earth system models is uh, tragic because you're trying to get the coupled carbon, energy, and water cycle properly um, predicted uh, coincidentally. And so here you, you solve one problem, which is a two meter temperature bias, and create another problem, um, which is this problem with the boundary layer and the realistic um, um, atmospheric demand for water at the surface. Um, why was I interested in open IFS? So um, with John Paolo Bassamo, I discussed a proposal, and the proposal was successful. It's called The Role of Soil Moisture and Weather Predictability over the U.S. Great Plains. It's funded by NASA um, for the next three years. The underlying science question that I asked was, how will assimilation of high-resolution NASA SMAP data refine modeled land atmospheric coupling and lead to improvements in short-term weather and wind energy forecast? So I have here a map of the um, equipped wind energy um, regions in the U.S. And my focus here is the Southern Great Plains. Um, this accounts for about 30% of the United States uh, wind energy production. My approach is to undertake a series of idealized experiments. And they're designed in a manner that will allow me to clearly distinguish between the roles of model phys physics, local remote soil moisture effects, SMAP data assimilation, and synoptic weather on the forecast scale. Uh, my hypothesis um, that drove uh, using open IFS was that the best data assimilation results will derive from the most realistically coupled model. Um, at the same time, we have NOAA and H. Tessel have benefited from 20 plus and 30 plus year operational development histories, respectively, uh, and there should be more direct intercomparisons. In the past, um, ECMWF did not uh, allow sharing of their model. Um, so these intercomparisons were limited, and they were never done in the same system with the same parameters and the same meteorological forcing. Um, thirdly, in the U.S. currently, we have a transition operationally from the NOAA 36 to the NOAA MP land surface model. It's already been implemented in our national water model, and it's soon to be implemented in the, in the suite of NSEP operational products, NLDAS, GLDAS, GFS, and CFS. Um, so my, my suggestion and my proposal was based on this idea that it's an opportune time now in the U.S. for this intercomparison. As part of the needed NOAA MP critical evaluations, why not also look for potential um, added value from lessons learned using HTESL? Um, my plans to use open IFS are, one, to implement uh, common surface parameters at one kilometer resolution in both land schemes. Um, that involves surface soil properties, leaf area greenness, and albedo will become um, prescribed on a daily real-time basis. Generally, these are climatological monthly values, um, but the, we're looking at the short-term forecast, 6 to 30 hours, so it's important that we have the, um, real -time, the latest real-time uh, surface conditions. After I um, standardize the surface parameters for both of the land models, I will add HTESL to the NASA land information system. I will then quantify the offline um, NOAA MP and HTESL uncertainty using this uh, post-processing verification, verification toolkit as part of NASA LIS. Um, once I've verified their offline performance, I will then couple LIS HTESL to the NASA Unified WARF. So then we're in a coupled modeling environment. And then uh, I will look at intercomparing the soil moisture data assimilation performance in LIS New WARF using both land schemes. Um, so here is my inner domain, outer domain. Um, my focus is wind energy forecasting, so I plotted here. This is the 925 hectopascal um, meridial wind, uh, mean wind speed, and vectors. So this is the low-level jet during JJA in the uh, Southern Great Plains. So that explains why there's such a dense, high density of wind farms in this region. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, um, this is just a. Uh, my monumental first open IFS H TESO run, so that's for uh, posterity, I guess. Um, and a really exciting thing that we've done for the land scheme, it's highly dependent on the soil parameterization. So, um, just like precipitation intensity 
matters, well, the land scheme that's seeing that precipitation intensity also matters in terms of the soil. If you imagine you have a, on the gradient of soil hydraulic conductivity, if you have a high intensity of precipitation and uh, low hydraulic conductivity prescribed as the soil, then you'll have a lot of runoff. If you just change that by a little bit, the response of the land scheme to a given intensity of precipitation um, varies drastically. Um, so we, in the U.S., there's a new 30 meter probabilistic soil series map, and it's uh, available at each of these layers. So we're going to apply a new layering scheme in HTESL and NOAA MP, so we'll have this consistent um, layering scheme that's consistent with the available soil texture properties. So here we have map three of the soil texture properties, residual soil moisture, saturated soil matrix potential, pore size distribution index, um, and there's three others that, that we use as well. Here's the citation, but I think this is very exciting work um, that um, previously there, there weren't uh, available products. I think this is the parallel to the HADIST um, probabilistic distribution of sea surface temperature um, period. This is the equivalent for soil moisture or soil texture and land surface schemes. Quickly, the list in the new wharf system. Here's the overview here. Um, this is the land, offline land system. We have the LDT is the pre-processing toolkit, so that pre-processes the parameters and the MET data. LVT is the post-processing, so everything from LIS can be passed to LVT for post-processing, uncertainty estimation, parameter um, estimation and calibration. This is coupled into New Wharf. Wharf has the uh, New Wharf has the Wharf ARW NCAR model as its core, but it has a number of proprietary NASA. Um, schemes, Goddard, Vis Goddard, this is NASA Goddard, microphysics, radiation, um, chemistry, um, EDA the, has a number of um, model forcing capabilities. So this is, um, enables NASA scientists to really um, leverage best all of their, uh, their suite of satellite instrumentation. To me, the key utility of LIS is that you can perform long-term offline spin-ups of the soil moisture uh, in the precise configuration that you're going to be running in the coupled uh, mode. So if I were to run my same data simulation experiment with um, this vanilla wharf, I would have to run it in very expensive coupled mode for five or six years. Um, but if I'm running this very cheap offline model, I can do the same thing uh, much cheaply, uh, much, more, uh, much less expensively, and at the same time I can do an analysis across uh, the sensitivity to different parameters like the soil textures that I mentioned. Um, so this is a quick summary of what we've done so far. We've completed updates to the surface parameters and soil layering for the US NOAA MP model. Um, that's now sorted out, so HTESO will be next. Um, I'm very interested in anyone willing to help test HTESO parameter sensitivity and to compile a couple of land atmosphere observation verification data sets. As part of the GWX Global Hydroclimatology Panel, I'm helping organize a new uh, North American regional hydroclimate experiment. And the proposal for that is to span, um, implement these Ameriflex stations with additional boundary profiling capabilities, so LIDAR and uh, radar. Um, this is one proposal. Over New York State, where I am located, we have a new mesonet, 125 meteorological stations, of which 17 have enhanced profiling capabilities with LIDAR and radiometers and flux stations. Um, so these would be the test beds providing the um, verification data for soil moisture planetary boundary layer covariance um, that, we plan that, that is critical to forecasting this low level um, wind. So here's the website for the New York Mesonet if you're interested. Um, this is a nice storm uh, cloud development sequence from yesterday morning I thought I might share with you. Thanks. This, this is trans? Yeah, this is out in, the, out in the harbor here yesterday morning. It Maybe took about one hour. The entire cycle is less than an hour. And you take that in the... In the, in the yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So, questions, okay? Yeah, so I'm afraid I don't know much about the NOAA uh, search, but where do you see the differences 